Chapter 30 Friday, April 4th, 1986 Everything before game time is a blur. Ordinarily, I'd be either stuck by the lockers un uninterested or seating at the back with, with the others, struggling to keep pace with coach's tactics. Today is better. Because of Jason's little huddle at lunch, not much of what coach says is new to me. Although it, it isn't any more more understandable. Strategy and ball talk whiz over my head, in and out of my ears. I know it's important stuff, but I've made a habit of not listening because I've never, I, I never get subbed in anyways. Besides, if I get subbed in today, I'm pretty sure I'll be told exactly what to do. What I've learned so far is the most important thing is for me to go out there and play my heart, even with something I'm not really that great at like basketball, the key to success remains the same, being myself. After giving us pointers to, on what to watch out for in their best players, coach en encourages us not to dwell on the team's name, to purge it from memory. Today, they are nameless, faceless op opponent. Spit flies out of his mouth as he speaks. All I want you to do is to see is all I want you to do, all I want you to see are opposition colors, a crowd of bodies to be barged through on our way to the championship. I want you to ram through those bodies. I want you to go out there and play until your joints ache, your eyes water and your knees bleed, your blood, sweat, and tears. That's what I want to see out there on the court. I'm sure every other teammate is going out there to play for the championship, but not me. At least not primarily. If I get to display my blood, sweat, and tears, it will be for me. I'm going out there to choose myself, to embrace all my faults and weaknesses, to fearlessly show the real Lucas Sinclair in the world. After all, tactics talk. It's time to take to the court. The team goes out first. The boos are louder than the cheers, which tells me we have a bigger crowd than usual. Deafening noise greets us when we pour out onto the court. The cheer squad is going hard. The band at full volume. The bleachers overflowing. I thought the pep rally was the peak of my time on this team, but I was wrong. Even if I don't set foot on that court, even if we don't win this championship, this will likely be one of the greatest nights of my life. We, we rise for the national anthem. Our singer is a bright and lively Nashville transplant named Tammy Thompson, who, it turns out, used to go, go here. Returning to Hawkins? That's a first. As soon as she starts singing, though, it becomes clear why she's back so soon. I poke a finger in my ear, to feign taking out wax. With the, light of pointing, with the lights pointing down on the court and onto my eyes, it's hard to see the bleachers well, especially as packed as they are. But something in me already knows my friends aren't here. My chest tightens. I want to be sad, angry, maybe even vengeful. But instead, I'm disappointed, half because they won't get to see me on the slim chance that I play on the biggest stage of my life, the other half because they don't get to see me become. When the anthem is over, I take my seat on the bench. The ball is tossed and the game begins. If I'm asked later how this game went last quarter, I won't know because I spend the first three quarters in two minds. First, I was lying to myself when I said I wasn't pissed at my friends, I'm, I'm royally incensed. Second, the Tigers aren't doing as, as well as planned, which means whatever dreams I had about being subbed into the game, gone. We take the lead pretty quickly, running up 26 points in no time. In my head, the Tigers are poised to crush the opposition, but they soon counter and go past us. By the end of the first quarter, they're three points ahead. Coach is furious. Did you not hear anything I said in that room? He bellows during the first quarter break. Go out there and guard your man. The second quarter goes by kind of the same way. We catch up, but every time we make a shot, they find their way back in. Every little hope of joy, 
of winning, of things working out as planned, gets cut off before we can even celebrate it. I find myself glancing at the bleachers. Maybe they're just late, I think. Maybe they're caught up with something. Maybe there's an emergency and I don't know. Maybe Will and Elle are back or they're Russians. Maybe there's a new monster in Hawkins. But just like, but just like the opposition's shots, each question is answered with the truth. My friends are not here on my biggest day of all because they don't think my game is that important. They don't think I'm that important. They don't think I'm friend, I'm friend enough. By the third quarter, it's clear that we're going to lose unless something drastic happens. And the moment I think that, and, and the moment I think that, it happens. The opposing captain, a tall and mean center with a ruthless fouling streak, crashes into Charlie just as he's going, up, going for a layup. Jason gets up in the center's face, veins crisscrossing his forehead, and the refs have, have to call for a bit of a calm. I've been watching Charlie the whole game. Something's been a bit off with him. He's distracted, dollying on the ball, traveling. We win a free throw from that misfortune, but more misfortune follows. Charlie's, Charlie can't stand. He has to be helped up by the teammates, and soon he's limping toward the bench. I'm so caught up by the ruckus that I don't even hear my name, Sinclair. I look up at the voice, surprised. Coach, you're in, he says. My eyes widen. You're in. Let's go. I take off my overshirt and pants in a daze. This is it. The moment I've been waiting for. This is my chance. My head turns involuntarily toward the bleachers to catch the gaze of someone I know and understand. Someone whose eyes say, yes, you did it. Go on and give them hell. They're so, they're, they, there are no such eyes in the stands though. No friends. But what I do see are hundreds of people waiting to see me. The real me. Whatever they once knew about me. They're no longer interested in. The only thing they will see and remember for years to come is what I put for what I put before them on this court, on the biggest stage of all. Breath, breathe. I can hear Jay's voice telling me, like in our practice sessions, just breathe. I shut my eyes, breathe, and get ready to take on the world. My job is simple. I only have to do three things. Defend, pass to Jason, shoot if open. Of course there's more things I, I should be doing as a point guard. Charlie takes most of the team's layups, for instance. But coach, but coach is worried that we're susceptible to fast breaks and wants me to contribute my tenacity and fresh legs to defense. I spend most of the remaining quarter defending warding off attacks and passing to Jason or the wing when he's not open. I prime my ear to filter out every sound but two, coach and Jason's voice, passing their instructions, translating them into hands and feet and off the ball um, movement. Each time I find my hands shaking, palms sweaty, the sound of the crowd getting too loud, anxiety threatened to choke me. I remember why I'm playing, not just for the championship, Lucas, I'm playing because I never want to be bullied anymore, never want to look at me and see someone in, in, in whose locker a bomb trap can be set. I'm playing because I want people to look at me and see me. I'm playing for Jay and Max and Mike and Dustin, even though I'm completely pissed off at most of them right now. I'm playing for everyone like us so that we may all exist in this town and be ourselves unashamed, unafraid, unlimited. At 68-69, with 10 seconds on the clock, and the Tigers down by a point, everything changes. It starts with Jason calling a, calling a timeout. Coach gives the instructions for our last play, with Jason insisting on the same point. Everyone, pass the ball to me. But he's our primary scorer, the best shooter left on the court. There's no way he won't be mobbed in the last 10 seconds. Coach thinks, too. Coach thinks so too and makes it known. For some reason, Jason insists that he can do it. Still, I make a mental note to position myself right in, right in case of any rebound opportunities. 
Whistle blows. Game resumes. I clean the dripping sweat from my face as, as play starts. The ball goes to Jason, and immediately, as predicted, he swarmed. <coughs> he tries his best. I'll give him I'll give that to him. A fancy fake out here. Some footwork there, and he manages to break the ankles of two defenders. He shoots, he misses. Hands reach towards the rebound, including mine. The only thought in my head is, God, let a tiger pick this up. But then somehow the ball is in my hands, and I'm looking at it. And I realize that I'm the tiger on the rebound. Shoot, comes, comes the scream from the crowd, or maybe it's in my head. The nearest defender advances toward me, eyes in the court. Jay says in my head, we don't have to be the best at all, best all the time. We just have to be enough for ourselves. I open up my body, step aside, evade the defender's lunge. The player goes one way, giving me just enough space to shoot. Two seconds on the clock. Be enough for yourself, says Jay. Everything else is secondary. I jump. I shoot. I don't know um, exactly what happens after that. I don't even see the, shoot, the shot go in. I don't hear the buzzer. All I hear is the bleachers change from the collective held breath to wild ecstasy. And then a deafening roar of victory. A crowd of people swallows me up. Coaches and teammates, medics. A smile plants itself on my face and won't let up. The crowd presses in, tighter and tighter, and everyone reaching for me in celebration and congratulations. It's more than everything I could have wished for. I look from face to face to see respect, adulation, maybe even love. So why have I never felt so alone?